What's good, YouTube? It's your boy 2K here. Man, I know y'all excited for tonight's fight. It's gonna be off the motherfucking chain. We got the undisputed championship at 140 pounds between Terrence Crawford and Julius Andongo. Now, this is gonna be a two part video. First, I wanna clear up some misconceptions that's been going through the media and on a lot of popular YouTube channels. Some cats seem to think that the last documented undisputed king was Jermaine Taylor, and that's false. Now, in previous videos on my channel, where I've talked about this fight and I've talked about undisputed status, I've gone on a, a very small campaign to educate my viewers that Jermaine Taylor was not the last documented undisputed champion, but it was indeed a guy by the name of O'Neill Bell fighting at a cruiserweight, right? Now this could be a testament to the fact that the cruiserweight division has never really been one of the more popular divisions, so maybe its history is somewhat in the mist to a lot of these boxing fans, right? Only recently with the inception of the World Boxing Series Tournament that includes the cruiserweight division has a magnifying glass been put over this particular division. Hell, even when Dwight Muhammad Kwai and uh, Evander Holyfield were in the cruiserweight division, it still was not the more popular division. It wasn't even one of the most popular division. So it could be that, or it could be the fact that O'Neill Bell uh, wasn't undisputed champion for a very long time. I think he was only undisputed for three months. You know what I'm saying? He also was not the best skilled fighter. I mean, he had a very questionable chin. You know what I'm saying? He lacked the mastery of the basics. But the one thing motherfuckers cannot forget if they know who O'Neill Bell is, is that he had a mean ass right hand. He actually had power in both hands. He knocked out 25 opponents out of his 27 wins. You know what I'm saying? Which is actually a 78% KO rate. Um, early in his career though, you know what I'm saying? He lost his second fight to a highly respected Algerian amateur by the name of Muhammad Ben Guzmia, right? And Ben Guzmia went on to, uh, before retiring, he won 40 fights I believe out of 44 fights you know what I'm saying so he was highly touted as a as an amateur and he was an accomplished professional he lost to him in his second fight but he proceeded to beat credible names in the division you know such as Arthur Williams now this is a guy that started his career in 1989 you know what I'm saying so O'Neill Bell got him kind of uh old but this was still a coming out party for O'Neill Bell as Arthur Williams has He's fought everybody in boxing almost, you know what I'm saying, with, within his uh, respective divisions. I mean, he's fought uh, Vicely Jirov, you know, uh, 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 Chris Bird, you know what I'm saying? He's fought a lot of cats, Orlin Norris, you know what I'm saying? So when he got in the ring with O'Neill Bell, he was seen as a very accomplished and highly respected uh, journeyman, so to speak. So kind of like Emmanuel Augustus was for uh, Floyd Mayweather, right? Um, you know, it could have been a, a situation where O'Neill Bell could have lost that fight. But not only did he knock him out in the first fight, he fought him again after uh, a couple fights in between and knocked him out for a second time, right? He also beat a guy by the name of Derek Harmon. Now, Derek Harmon is is more known for fighting Roy Jones Jr. Uh, and pretty much losing every single round until he was knocked out in the 10th round. But he's fought pretty much a lot of guys... Uh, kind of the same as uh, Arthur Williams. He's fought a lot of guys within the light heavyweight and the cruiserweight division, a lot of respectable names, and he's beaten some of those guys, right? He also beat a guy by the name of Ezra Sellers. Now, I remember Ezra Sellers as being talked about by a lot of boxing pundits as one of the hardest hitting men in boxing history. They were comparing him to cats like Ernie Shavers and Julian Jacks. They were comparing him to guys like that. You know what I'm saying? He was knocking motherfuckers out left and right. Um, I think he actually has the same uh, knockout ratio, if I'm not mistaken, as O'Neill Bell. 25 knockouts um, and 27 of his wins, I believe. I'm not looking at it right now. But, yeah, Ezra Sellers was a highly respected knockout artist. And he beat him. En route to becoming the IBF champion, he beats a Canadian standout by the name of Dale Brown. And that's how he got his first title the vacant IBF title. He ended up knocking him out, right? After that fight, he steps up in 2006, and this is the fight that makes him the last documented undisputed king in boxing. 
He stepped up and fought John Mark Mormon, right? Now, this is before the WBO belt was included as one of the belts needing to be captured in order to be named undisputed. They didn't include the WBO until 2007. This fight happened January of 2006, right? So it was for the IBF, the WBA, and the WBC title. Mormick held the WBA and the WBC at that time. In a very interesting fight, a close fight, it was exciting, went back and forth. O'Neill Bell ends up knocking out Jean-Marc Mormick in the 10th round, becoming the last undisputed champion documented in 2006. Now, Jermaine Taylor was undisputed champion when he beat Bernard Hopkins in 2005. This is why he's not the last documented undisputed king. Now, Jermaine Taylor was undisputed longer than O'Neill Bell. O'Neill Bell ended up getting stripped of, go ahead and guess, I'll give y'all niggas <laughs> a couple of seconds to guess, the fucking IBF title, right? The same organization that was actually going to hold up the Terrence Crawford, Julius Ndongo unification belt, trying to bring in this motherfucking Sergey Linton nuts. You know what I'm saying? The IBF strips O'Neill Bell because they wanted him to defend his title against uh, Christoph Velarczyk. Velarczyk is the same guy who's still fighting at Cruiserweight, and I believe he's uh, an entry in the World Boxing Series tournament. He was supposed to uh, defend his title against him, but I believe Jean-Marc Mormick had a, um, a rematch clause. So he, he had to adhere to the rematch clause. And this is very reminiscent of what happened with the IBF and Tyson Fury. He had a rematch clause with uh, Vladimir Klitschko. He had to adhere to it, so the IBF stripped him. Same shit here. He had to adhere to it, so he rematched Jean-Marc Mormick in March of the same year, which is two months after becoming undisputed, right? But he was stripped. So along with being stripped of the IBF, he was stripped of his undisputed status. And then he ended up losing to Jean-Marc Mormick, you know what I'm saying, in that fight uh, by, I believe, a unanimous decision. So Jermaine Taylor ended up not getting stripped of the WBA title until June of that same year. That's when he lost his undisputed status. I believe the WBA wanted Jermaine Taylor to fight Felix Sturm, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Jermaine Taylor went on to, to fight somebody else. I can't remember. I think it was uh, Winky Wright, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember who he fought instead of defending against uh, Felix Stern. But the WBA ended up stripping him in June. So he was undisputed longer, but he wasn't the last documented, right? Um, O'Neill Bell went on, you know what I'm saying, after that to fight Tomas Ademic, uh, Richard Hall, and, journeyman by, and a journeyman by the name of Rico Carlson. And he ended up getting stopped in two of his last three fights um i think his last fight was in 2011 he ended up retiring uh, in 2015 uh o'neill bell was murdered in similar fashion to vernon force it was a uh, an attempted robbery in atlanta georgia and he was shot down so um i want to get that out there because this is a guy who was etched in boxing history as becoming undisputed king Rest in peace to O'Neill Bell. Alright, let's move into the meat of this video. Man, I can't wait for tonight, you know what I'm saying? Terrence Crawford versus Julian and Dongo, you know what I'm saying, for the undisputed title. Now, as it pertains to 140 pounds, this is going to be the first undisputed champion since 2001 when Costa Zoo beat Zab Judah. Y'all remember, he made that motherfucker do the Macarena. <laughs> motherfucker was doing the chicken dance, sliding all over the place, doing the electric slide and shit. You know what I'm saying? Before, uh, uh, what was it, uh, Jay Nady stopped the fight, I believe it was. And uh, uh, Zab Judah looked like he wanted to beat the shit out of Jay Nady. <laughs> that was the last undisputed champion at 140 pounds. And people, this is a long ass time ago. You know what I'm saying? Costa Zoo's been retired for a long time since losing to Ricky Hatton, right? I mean, this motherfucker's a trainer now. <laughs> He's a bunch of years removed from being a fighter. So, I mean, this shit is well overdue. You know what I'm saying? We're talking 16 years. So, let's start with Julius Ndongo. My man is 22-0 with 11 knockouts. He's 5'10 with a 71 and a half 
inch reach. Now that's a two inch height advantage and a one and a half inch reach advantage. Now, Julius Ndongo's story is fucking excellent. Um, in a four month span, from December of 2016 to April of 2017, Julius Ndongo achieved the Nambian dream. And I say Nambian because he's not American. I can't say the American dream, right? He's achieved the Nambian dream. Um, and he's become the most popular fighter coming out of Nambia since Harry Simon. Now, if y'all don't know who Harry Simon is, he defeated Winky Wright in 1998 right and a very exciting fight very close fight actually the decision was overturned the initial decision was given to winky Wright, i believe but it was a it was an error in how the scorecards read and it was actually a decision win i believe it was split decision for harry simon and uh, he went on to become an undefeated fighter in retirement so he was one of the guys that uh, a lot of people don't know blood has an excellent video out on harry simon and the history of him uh, as it pertains to his boxing career and how much the Nambian people loved him. Uh, go check that video out, it's very informative. But Julius Ndongo has become one of the more popular fighters on his level out of that particular country, right? It's excellent to see a guy in four months become a two-time champion at 140, and then four months after that, place himself to possibly become the next undisputed king at 140 pounds, right? I mean, the, the last eight months have been magical for Julius Ndongo. This is an excellent story. If you don't even like this fight, you should watch it out of respect for the storyline that Julius Ndongo brings into this fight. You know what I'm saying? Now, he has a herky-jerky style, very fucking awkward uses every bit of his range, you know what I'm saying? Uh, stays on the outside, leads with the jab almost every single time. It's hard to pinpoint his movements and what he will follow up with because he's always jerking his body, you know what I'm saying? He may slide to the left, he may slide to the right, he may dip, he may do some shit that you really can't uh, uh, pinpoint, you know what I'm saying? It, it makes it hard to pinpoint anyway, right? He has a pretty good jab, like I said, he sets everything up with it. Um, he has a uh, he does an excellent job using the jab straight combination. He'll jab you to the head, then he'll follow up with a straight left hand to the body. Of course, he's a southpaw, right? He also does this combination where he's jabbing to the body, throws one jab to the body, then he comes upstairs with another jab, then he follows with a left hook. And if you're his opponent, you're looking at him. He seems to be out of position. You know what I'm saying? With his his uh, his herky jerky style, his awkward style. He looks to be out of position to be doing that. So you may be like, he's not gonna land that shit. But his range is, he's so fucking rangy and he's so awkward that he's able to land all of those shots if you're not paying attention. So it's really a testament to the opponent's IQ whether or not he's able to uh, pinpoint this awkwardness that uh, Julius Ndongo has, right? My cons of him, when he throws combinations, that's when he becomes extremely fucking wild. If you look at the, the 42nd Eduard Troyanovsky fight, he knocked him out in the first round to capture the IBF title, right? Before, right before the knockout, he's kind of backing up, and Eduard Troyanovsky's coming forward. Julius Sandango stops, plants his feet, throws a right hook. When he throws the right hook, he stays right there. He doesn't bring it home. He's wide open for a fucking counter pauses for at least a second maybe a half a second right then he comes back brings a motherfucking left hook all the way from florida and ends up knocking eduard Troyanovsky out with it landing square on his chin now i will say this when that punch landed eduard Troyanovsky closed his eyes which is one of the biggest things you should never do as a boxer you never close your motherfucking eyes and wait for a hit to land on you. <laughs> so that was a major mistake by Edouard, you know what I'm saying? But the time interval, the window that he gives when he's throwing combinations, right? It, it leaves him very susceptible to be countered, right? He also lacks dynamic 
footwork. He mostly just moves forwards and backwards in a bouncing motion. And he's also following movers around the ring. Now, there's going to be an important fight that I'm going to mention uh, when I get to Terrence Crawford, right? That if Terrence Crawford fights in this particular way, well, based on how Julius Ndongo was following Ricky Burns around the ring, and, and Ricky Burns wasn't even displaying any lateral movement, which is one of the reasons why he got beaten. He was just moving backwards and forwards, doing too much thinking on how to get around this herky-jerky style coming from a southpaw, how to get around the range, right? He kept running into jabs. He didn't know what to do, so he just kept moving backwards and forwards. And he made, you know, step laterally, but he wasn't providing angles. He wasn't turning Julius Ndongo, right? Um, so Ndongo just following him around the ring. That's a negative to me. If you got a guy that's that's going to fight a particular way, um, you can't just follow him around the ring. You got to learn how to cut the ring off. You know what I'm saying? Also, he has absolutely no head movement. In the first round of the uh, Ricky Burns fight, Julius Ndongo lunged in with a jab, which in itself is a bad technique. He lunges in with the jab. Ricky Burns catches him with a beautiful counter right, right, uh, straight right hand. You know what I'm saying? It didn't have much on it. Julius Ndongo took it. But my point is, uh, Julius Ndongo keeps his head right there in front of you. You know what I'm saying? He does some body, upper body movement that's different than head movement. Uh, Julius Ndongo, to me, in my opinion, has not shown the ability to be able to slip a prolific jab like Terrence Crawford's, right? He may do some herky-jerky upper body movement, and that, of course, is a testament to why he's so awkward, is his upper body movement. When you're boxing a guy, you're really looking at his upper body movement. You don't, you rarely look at his feet. You look at his feet from a distance, um, but when he's within mid-range distance, you're kind of looking at his his upper body, trying to see where his upper body goes. It's kind of the same thing in basketball when you're guarding a very good point guard who's very quick. You watch his upper body movements to basically pinpoint what his next move is going to be. And that's, like I said, that's what makes him very awkward. But with his head not moving, it gives people an opportunity to counter and to place a punch exactly where they want it to go. And it should land almost 100% of the time, right? Let's get to my man Terrence Crawford. By the way, Julius Ndongo holds the IBF and the WBA titles, one off of Dwar Troyanovsky and Ricky Burns, right? Terrence Crawford holds the WBO and WBC 140-pound titles, right? Terrence Crawford is 31-0 with 22 knockouts. He's 5'8 with a 70-inch reach. Now, of course, like I said earlier, Julius Ndongo has a 2-inch height advantage and a 1.5-inch reach advantage right Terrence Crawford I'm trying to tell Cass man Terrence Crawford is that motherfucking dude <laughs> you know what I'm saying in the uh, live podcast that I did last night with my man Bo from Truth and Facts About Boxing I also did it with the lovely Adrian who will be on my show in the near future uh, chopping boxing up with us she believes that he hasn't fought every single style you know guys like uh, York is Gamboa Ricky Burns, Raimundo Beltran, those three fighters in itself don't fight the same type of style. But I see where she's going. I think it's uh, the reason why she feels that way is because Terrence Crawford has shown a divide <laughs> between his skill set and his opponent's skill set. He really only struggled, and it wasn't really a struggle the entire fight, right? But he only struggled minimally against Yuri Urkis Gamboa. And at that time, Yuri Urkis Gamboa was an undefeated boogeyman of boxing, right? Motherfuckers did not want to fight him, and that includes Mikey Garcia, right? So Terrence Crawford took the challenge, struggled a little bit uh, as expected, because Yuri Urkis Gamboa was extremely respected, but then proceeds to knock him out and hand him his first defeat, right? He showed a divide in that, in that fight. Ricky Burns had only lost to Alex Arthur, right? Um, I think that was his 13th professional fight. Alex Arthur is a domestic level fighter, um, but he lost to him, then proceeded to become the WBO champion. And leading up to the Crawford fight, he still only had that one loss. And I believe he has something like, you know, 26 wins. I'm not looking at his record right now. But he had won a lot of fights after the Alex Arthur fight, right? Terrence Crawford went to, to the UK and showed a divide in that fight. Showed why he is superior skill-wise. Then the WBO 
champion who ends up becoming a two weight champion in uh, Ricky Burns. Right. He showed a divide against a guy who is considered one of the top 10 fighters at 130 pounds, and that's Raimundo Beltran, right? Raimundo Beltran is, you know, as we all know, has been a long time sparring partner for Manny Pacquiao, and, and uh, pretty much having that experience in sparring with Manny, he's actually honed his abilities, right? He's becoming a pretty good fucking fighter and a problem for any of the top guys in any division he chooses to campaign in. He was even a problem for Ricky Burns. And a lot of cats thought that Beltran was robbed in that fight, right? Well, Terrence Crawford showed a motherfucking divide in that fight. Then we get to Victor Postal. Postal is a guy who Danny Garcia didn't want no parts of. Beating the shit out of everybody. I think his, uh, his best win before Danny Garcia paid step aside money to him in order to fight Lamont Peterson was against Selkic Iden, right? Same guy that uh, Robert Guerrero uh, fought in his debut fight at 147 pounds, right? Um, Victor Postal beat the living shit out of Selkic Iden. Was paid step aside money. Ends up fighting Lucas Matisse. Makes Lucas Matisse quit. He beats Matisse in better fashion than Danny Garcia did, right? Going into the Terrence Crawford fight, a lot of people thought Terrence Crawford was going to lose to Victor Postal because he was an excellent boxer from the outside and he was also another rangy guy like Julius Ndongo. Now, if you haven't figured out, the fight that I said I was going to mention that's going to be key for Terrence Crawford, I'm talking about it right now. You know what I'm saying? A lot of motherfuckers I respect, cats in the movement, you know what I'm saying? thought Victor Postal was going to beat Terrence Crawford. Terrence Crawford went out there, stayed on the outside, used superior footwork, and provided angles whenever Victor Postal would start to close the distance. That shit is important against Julius Ndongo. Uh, this is the reason why Ricky Burns pretty much lost to him, because he wasn't providing any angles. Made, listen to this, made Victor Postal follow him around the ring, right? Julius Ndongo is going to follow you around the ring. Victor Postal followed Terrence Crawford around the ring. The difference here is that Crawford provided angles whenever uh, Postal was going to close that distance. And he ended up winning every single fucking round on top of knocking him down three fucking times in that fight. Dog, my scorecard looked like a goddamn basketball game. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was a blowout. It was like, you know what I'm saying? Golden State Warriors played the Philadelphia 76ers. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 120 to 105 was my motherfucking scorecard. You know what I mean? Um, you had to take three points away because he knocked him down three times. It was fucking insane how Terrence Crawford showed a divide and probably the biggest fight of his career he showed a complete divide and showed why not only his skill set physically, but the intangibles, right? Like his IQ, why he is such an upper echelon fighter and why there is such a divide between him and his opponents. Now, Julius Ndongo fights very similarly to Victor Postal, guys. Actually, I would love to see a Victor Postal, Julius Ndongo matchup, you know, later after this fight, however it pans out, right? Victor Postal fights from the outside behind that jab, same as Julius Ndongo. Victor Postal's a bit awkward. He's kind of upright. That's my uh, one of my criticisms of him uh, before going into the Crawford fight. One of the reasons why I picked Crawford to win that fight, but even I didn't have Crawford winning 120 to 105. I had Crawford winning by split decision before that fight. Um, but he's, he's, he's a little too upright and Dongo's not upright. He's like I said, he's doing a lot of, uh, upper body movement. Um, so he's not, he's not, uh, upright, but Victor Postal moves the same kind of way Julius and Dongo does forward and back. Right. Actually Postal moves a little bit better. He was turning the shit out of Lucas Matisse. You know what I'm saying? The flaw that he did was the same as Julius and Dongo. He followed Crawford around the ring and Dongo followed 
Ricky Burns around the ring. He followed a Ricky Burns that really wasn't even showing prolific movement. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And honestly, I think Victor Postal is a more skilled fighter than Julius Ndongo. He has more of the basics down. Um, Julius Ndongo, as I said before, he's a little bit too wild. When he wants to get you out of there, when he wants to throw combinations, when he's not just, you know, kind of uh, stand on the outside, you know, trying to pepper you with a jab and a straight right combination, when he actually wants to implement uh, variation to his combinations, that's when he gets too fucking wild. Victor Postal was never wild. You know what I'm saying? He's actually a very fundamentally sound boxer. I really still believe, uh, believe Victor Postal is one of the best fighters at 140, even though he got embarrassed by Terrence Crawford. Now, hopefully that fight didn't, didn't fuck up his mental uh, fortitude, right? Because he has been out since losing that fight. But I think he can beat any other 140-pound fighter out there, and that includes Julius Ndongo, right? So I think this is actually a fight, just based on um, footage that I've seen. I think this is a fight that's actually going to be less of a challenge than the Victor Postal fight. I got Terrence Crawford beating Julius Ndongo. Hold on to your motherfucking seats. <laughs> I got Terrence Crawford beating Julius Ndongo by fifth round knockout. You know what I'm saying? I think this is how the fight's gonna play out. Julius Ndongo is a fast starter, very fast starter, right? I think he's gonna look good in the first three rounds. But Terrence Crawford has the IQ of one of the best fighters in boxing, okay? There's only a few guys you can put on this short list of an upper echelon IQ, and Terrence Crawford is one of them, right? Also, Terrence Crawford can fight you uh, the same way in an orthodox or southpaw stance. And I've always said this. I said this many times. When you're fighting an opponent that is a switch hitter, right? In your training camp, you have to get sparring partners that can prepare you to fight two fighters in one night. You got to get sparring partners that can prepare you to fight a southpaw, and then they have to prepare you to fight an orthodox fighter. Then on top of that, those two guys have to fight similar to Terrence Crawford but this is the problem it's hard to emulate Terrence Crawford's IQ it's hard to emulate an IQ period <laughs> you know what I'm saying it's it's easy to emulate a dumb nigga right <laughs> it's easy to train for a dumb nigga you know what I'm saying if a motherfucker is not really that smart you can get guys that are smarter than him and that'll 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 be more than enough needed to get prepared for that guy's IQ. Actually, you're not even preparing for the nigga's IQ because he's dumb. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But Terrence Crawford, Andre Ward, Guillermo Rigondeaux, Floyd Mayweather, you know, you can't get sparring partners to emulate the IQ of these fighters. That's the biggest fucking problem I see in this fight, right? Now, like I said before in a previous video, there's plenty of switch hitters out there. You know, uh, but there's only two switch hitters in the game right now that have mastery at both fucking stances, and that's Andre Ward and Terrence Crawford. I got Terrence Crawford winning this fight by fifth round knockout. Like I said, uh, Julius Ndongo is gonna look good first three rounds because he's a he's a fast starter. I'm not saying that he's gonna win those first three rounds. I'm saying he will look as if he's going. To be a problem but in round four and terence crawford's actually a slow starter it usually takes him about three rounds with the exception to victor postal <laughs> you know what i'm saying dominated that shit from round one out but it usually takes him about three rounds he's a cerebral fighter he reads his opponent right takes him three rounds to see what you're gonna do then he adapts one of the biggest adaptations he made against uh, victor postal i believe in two of the three knockdowns that he scored against victor they were subsequent check left hooks. <laughs> subsequent check left hooks landed at the beginning of, of uh, subsequent rounds. I can't remember what the two rounds were, but the first round, ding, 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 came out, hit him with check left hook, dropped him. Second round, ding, 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 came out, check left hook, dropped him. <laughs> 
And the reason why he was able to do that is because he adapted. He noticed that he was able to do that to Victor Postal, right? Julius Ndongo with his ability to be countered. Um, and I think uh, based on the the um, the weigh-in that happened yesterday, I think Julius Ndongo is going to start out fast like he does in every fight, but he's going to have a chip on his shoulder. He's got a lot of pressure from the Nambian people wanting him to beat Terrence Crawford. You know what I'm saying? I think uh, the pressure might be a little bit too high. Maybe, maybe not. He seems to be a well-grounded uh, fighter when it comes to uh, pressure and, and IQ. I don't think he lets pressure get to him. Shit, he went uh, in, into a door Trinovsky's backyard and he went to the UK and, and defeated uh, Ricky Burns. So I don't think pressure really gets to him. But this guy here, Terrence Crawford, his IQ is nowhere near the IQ of a Ricky Burns, Troy Nofsky. Where those two guys couldn't figure out the herky-jerky style of Ndongo, Terrence Crawford almost 100% guaranteed will be able to pinpoint Ter uh, uh, Julius Ndongo's herky-jerky style, his herky-jerky movements, things that, you know, Ricky Burns and, and uh, Troy Nofsky couldn't figure out, Terrence Crawford will, okay? I think in that fourth round, he's going to come out. He's going to already have the, uh, the game plan needed to beat. Julius Ndongo, the fourth round is going to be the most one-sided round we've seen in this fight. And then in the fifth round, Julius Ndongo is going to continue to do what he always does because he doesn't deviate. If you look at the Ricky Burns fight, Julius Ndongo, he sticks to the same game plan. Okay, he doesn't. And, and that could be because he was beating Ricky Burns. But even fighters that are able to show that they're not one-dimensional, they still mix it up even if they're dominating a fight. Terrence Crawford has done that plenty of times. To show that he's not one dimensional he can fight you on the inside and on the outside right he can switch um julius and dongo pretty much did the same shit throughout the throughout the uh, ricky burns fight so i am predicting that julius and dongo after losing the fourth round will continue to come out and do the same shit and that's where he will be hit by something he doesn't see and that's going to hurt him and terence crawford is going to overwhelm him with the referee waving off the fight that's my prediction um if it doesn't, go, if it isn't a knockout, uh, a lot of the cats I respect have uh, Crawford knocking Julius Ndongo out by round eight or round nine, and I, I could see that happening as well. And it will be the same thing, you know. Whatever round it takes for Terence Crawford to show that he's already adapted, that's what's going to happen. And once he adapts, that's when you're going to see the divide in talent. But I just believe in this particular fight, it will end in a knockout. If it doesn't, I got Terence Crawford winning this fight. 118 to 110 by unanimous decision that's 10 rounds to two let me know what y'all think about this fight who you got winning do what you do in the comment section would be real this is real talk for real fans one